Can you hear me? Yeah. Here I am. How's everybody doing tonight? Good. You know, God never ceases to amaze me with his goodness and his faithfulness. And um, you can't help but feel inadequate, right? As God's people. So it's this delicate balance between feeling inadequate to receive all that he's done for us and then also feeling this incredible privilege and right that he's given us as his children to have what we have. He's like, he says, yes, you're deserving. Yes, you're worthy of what I've done for you. I wouldn't have come and done it if you weren't worthy of it. Just even just one. So I'm grateful tonight um, for the Lord, for his goodness and his faithfulness. And so I just want to share with you tonight what the Lord has laid on my heart and what I've been studying the last few weeks. Um, uh, I started this study probably, let's see, late August. I started it when we headed on to vacation. I thought, you know what? Like, I want to make the most of this vacation. And I want to rest, so what I'm going to study in my Bible is rest. The devotions I'm going to read are going to be about rest. And so I thought I would do that for 10 days. And here I am, a month and a half or more later, um, still studying, still turning over more information. And so I just want to share with you what I've learned and so when I was preparing to type up my notes, and um, I'm like, I started typing, and it was just like rapid fire, like um, facts, just like tidbits and facts about the Sabbath <laughs> and about rest. And I'm like, well, Lord, that's, that's great. Like, I'm really grateful for all of this knowledge and all of these little tidbits of information, and um, but... I got to have a way to organize this and make this, like, fit together. You know, it's like I had the puzzle pieces scattered all over the table, but I needed to put them together. And so the Lord, um, I believe, helped me to do that, and so I hope to communicate that well tonight. Um, but before I get started, I want to share something funny that happened today. So you probably all have noticed that I have pink hair, right? I decided to do something wacky and wild and fun. And, you know, I, you get to your 30s, and you kind of become really subdued in your life. Like, you become way too adult, right? And so growing up, I was this kid that loved bright colors and funky stuff. I had a bedroom that every single wall was a different color. And I used to joke and laugh all the time and a couple months ago, well, probably the last six months, I've been thinking, like, where is, where did she go? Like, where's fun Lindsay? Where did she go? So I saw this lady on Instagram, and she put pink in her hair, and I thought it was just so adorable. So I decided to give it a try. Anyway, you didn't need to know all that. Thanks, Mom. Mom says it's cute. My hubby likes it, so that's good. But today, I stopped by and saw my husband at work, and He's like, you know, across the street, and he's trying to, you know, give me a, a little compliment, a little cat call, you know, trying to be all cute. And he's like, hey, there's my full glass of lemonade. And I'm like, um, I don't think that's the way the compliment goes. And also, I may have also gone pink to distract from my hips. And now you're just telling me it didn't work. So, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I'm going to talk about rest tonight. And when you are unrested, our bodies were intended to be at rest and to have times of rest and seasons of rest. And when you're not rested, things like that come out of your mouth, right? So, I want to save you all the embarrassment tonight and teach you about the Lord's design for us in rest and in Sabbath. So um, rest and Sabbath are two different things, which I'm sure you all know that, um, but in the Christian world, they kind of get really intermingled. And so I want to talk about some of the differences and similarities 
Um, But I'll start in Genesis 2, verses 2 and 3, and it says, On the seventh day God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because um, because that in it he had rested from all his work, which God had created. Uh, which God created and made. Then we jump to Exodus 31, 13. It says, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. Exodus 31, 15, skipping verse 14. For six days work may be done, but on the seventh day there is a Sabbath of complete rest, holy to the Lord, Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day shall pure, surely be put to death. So I started looking up, like, what does Sabbath mean? So the Sabbath is clearly God's plan of rest for his people. It's not rest, but it's his plan of rest. It's what he designed for us. Um, so I started studying the formal practice of Sabbath that the Hebrew people held and then a lot of the Orthodox Jews still today hold. And um, so much of it has to do with um, reflecting on creation. They begin their tradition on, um, is it Friday evening or Saturday evening? Friday evening with a prayer of blessing that speaks about the Lord of the Sab- the Lord of creation, God of the universe, the one who created the earth. And so we have that creation piece of Sabbath, and then we move here um, into um, Deuteronomy. So we move on down to Deuteronomy, and it says, um, let's see where to go. Deuteronomy 6 um, Nope, that's not it. It's Deuteronomy 5, 13 through 15. And it says, Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. So we have our bookends on the Sabbath. We've got creation and God's redemption of the Israelites and bringing them out of Egypt. So to me... That means the Sabbath is about creation and sanctification or redemption. So in Scripture, we see that Sabbath linked back to creation over and over again. And um, it's the fourth commandment in the Ten Commandments. And so in that commandment, the command is to observe the Sabbath. But what we miss sometimes is that um, command to work is in that command to rest. So there's this relationship linked between work and rest that God intended. They support each other. Um, They're partners in crime. And so God worked and he rested. And then in the fourth commandment, he tells us to work and then rest. So there's this balance that has to take place that God created and intended for our good. Another thing to note is that in the creation account in Genesis, he talks about um, each of the six days of creation, and God saw that it was good, and God saw that it was good, and God saw that it was good. But then he gets to the Sabbath, and it says that he blessed it and sanctified it and made it holy. So this is the first thing that God has called holy in the scripture. And so I think it's really important that when God calls something holy, it means this thing that I'm giving you, this gift of the Sabbath, it's my very character. It's part of, the, it's part of who I am. Holiness is who God is, right? He's a holy God. None but him are holy. So he declared and called the Sabbath that it was holy. So work is good and rest is is holy. The six days of creation were labeled good, but then we have that holy word used in, um, towards the Sabbath. So the Sabbath was instituted by God as a perpetual covenant. So it's a reminder of creation that I created, 
I did all of this. I set this into motion. I'm doing it well. It's continuing well. It's in harmony. I called it good, and I'm finished, and now I'm resting. Yes. And then in the, uh, the Exodus, it's the reminder that I am the Lord your God. I am. Yes. I brought you out. I did this. I take care of my people. I send manna from heaven. All of that is wrapped up in this concept of the Sabbath. So, New Testament, Jesus comes, and he's the fulfillment of the, of the Sabbath. He's the fulfillment of all the law and prophets, right? And so, he comes, and then we add the Gentiles into the mix, and the Gentiles begin to ask, so do we need to start observing, observing the tradition of Sabbath the way the, the Jews do? Um, and it was clear that because Jesus had came, that the rule of Sabbath had been done away with, but not the rhythm of rest that happened at creation. See, the Sabbath was a sign to point to Jesus. These were all things that were types and shadows to point forward to Jesus. And then Jesus arrives, and he is our Sabbath. He said that he's the Lord of the Sabbath. So I think one of the reasons that God instituted the Sabbath, I mean, it was a sign of the covenant. God wanted his people to be reminded regularly, I am your God, I will take care of you. I am your God, I will take care of you. I created the world, I will take care of you. And um, so it was a weekly reminder of his covenant. And so the Hebrew people... How many of you know that there is the cycle of sin and deliverance, sin and deliverance, over and over again in the New Testament? You read in the books of the Judges, all the time God's bailing his people out. Um, And I think there's a tendency in our humanity to think that we can handle things, right? So we learn in the books of the law, there's all of these like sacrificial offerings and all these things that we have to do to that that the hebrew children had to do to for atonement to atone for their sins i've done all this thing all these things wrong and now i'm going to sacrifice this lamb and i'll be good right but i think it was easy because the atonement of sin was perpetuated what they felt like with the things they were sacrificing it wasn't the things that they were sacrificing that were atoning their sins it was god that was dealing fairly and mercifully with their sins. And so I think it became, the Lord knew that they would need that reminder that you're not saving yourselves. You have nothing to do with this. This is all me. Like you need to stop and remember every single week that it's not you, it's me. When he provided manna from heaven, he told them, Gather on the sixth day, double, and trust me for the seventh day. And gather nothing on the seventh day. Because he wanted them to remember and walk in faith and trust with him. Um, So the commandments were given in the first place, according to Deuteronomy 6, 1 through 2. And it says, these commands... These are the commands, the decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you're crossing Jordan to possess so that you, okay, here's the reason I'm giving these commands. This is why. You've ever asked why, God, do we have the Ten Commandments? Here you go. It says, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you and so that you may enjoy long life. So now we bring in this fear of the Lord, which is, in reality, it's faith. It's the acknowledgement of God's sovereignty, his aboveness, you know. He's being up here above it all. So the fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord is a position of faith. And Proverbs 19.23 says, The fear of the Lord leads to life so that one may sleep satisfied, untouched by evil. You know when you're the most vulnerable? 
When are you the most vulnerable? When you're asleep. And we sleep for 30% 30 of our lives is spent in sleep. So God's telling you, when you fear me, even in your most vulnerable you will be satisfied with peaceful sleep and untouched by evil because I am watching over you. Jesus is our Sabbath rest. It is in him that we have all that we need. And if we walk through this life and don't set aside times and seasons to acknowledge that in our every day, in our every week, we're missing out big time on the blessing of God. The Lord blessed the Sabbath. That means when you are in the Sabbath, when you are in Jesus Christ, when he is Lord of your life, you are blessed. You're walking in that Sabbath, that seventh day rest that he prepared for us. One more scripture, Ezekiel 20, 12, says, I gave them my Sabbaths as a sign between me and them so that they might know that I, the Lord, sanctify them. So we've got this concept of Sabbath that we have a God that when we acknowledge him as Lord over our life, he does amazing, awesome things. And our life comes into alignment with his deity and with his goodness, and life is better, right? That blessed life that we hear talked about a lot. But when God instituted in creation the rhythm, not, not the rule, he didn't set a rule at that time. In Genesis, God didn't set the rule. He set the rhythm or the spirit of the law. He set a rhythm, rhythm because he knew how he created Adam and Eve. He knew how their bodies would, would function. And so when God sets something into motion, he never does a partial work and he never does it without purpose and reason. Everything God does, he does for a purpose, he does for a reason. So I want to talk to you about the rhythm of rest and how essential it is to us in every aspect of our life. So without this rhythm of rest in our lives, our bodies break down, our minds break down. I'll share a funny story with you. Mom and I were driving up at Canal Winchester today, and we came up on an accident that had just happened. It didn't look like a super serious accident in terms of people hurt, but it took up like the whole overpass on Gender Road going over 33. And so, you know, there's the tow truck is just getting there. There's only one sheriff's deputy there. And so while we're passing, this other sheriff's deputy comes up and, like, crosses both lanes of traffic. And he kind of, like, sits in a weird position, and people don't know if they're supposed to go around him or if they're supposed to stop behind him. So then I think he realizes it, and so he kind of pulls where he's, like, perpendicular across both lanes pretty much gets out of his cruiser and starts walking, starts to leave his car, walking towards the accident, did not put his car in park. His car starts rolling backwards, so he must have put it into reverse instead of park. His cruiser starts rolling backwards. He's wedged between the door, so he's getting hit by the door, stumbling backwards, and then you see it hit his face, like what he has done. And luckily he catches himself, gets in the car, and he's able to do it just before he hits a car and causes another accident. This is what happens when we don't observe rhythms of rest. Our minds break down and we forget to put our cars in park. We call our wives full, glasses of pink lemonade instead of tall. We are human, and that's not a knock against us. So many times we, it's like, well, they're only human, and they use it as an excuse to be weak or like it's a broken state, and yes, our flesh is broken, but 
we are human and God created us human, right? So he may have created us and then sin came along and brokenness came into the world, but he gives us a way of escape always. He gives us a way to deal with what we've been given, with our humanness. Rest is a big part of that. So the fact that Jesus came and fulfilled the law doesn't dismiss our need to observe times of rest. It doesn't dismiss our need to observe him as Lord of our life or take time off. It doesn't dismiss either one of those. We, if not more than the people before Jesus, should be observing those things, right? Because look what he did for us. We are not bringing lambs to the altar. We're not bring, having burning the flesh of bulls and turtle doves and all these other things. So we should even more be regarding and observing this Sabbath rest that he talks about. So I believe God wants us to be whole. So this rhythm of rest that he set in place is his plan for us to be whole. So in my reading, I learned about there's, I didn't know this. Some of you may have known this. There's seven different types of rest that we need to be whole as humans. So we need physical rest, mental rest, sensory rest, creative rest, emotional rest, social rest, and spiritual rest. Now, that's a lot, but I'm going to pull from some scriptures to show where God supports all of this. Like, he doesn't do anything halfway. Everything he does is complete, and it's whole. One of the things that has just kind of been burning inside of me. We, last night we watched this documentary on the Exodus account and the parting of the Red Sea, and this guy was using like satellite imagery and all this stuff to track the course of the Israelites from where they were in Egypt and to see if it was even possible that something like that could happen, you know, trying to science it. And there's a lot of it that science could completely support. A lot of evidence that says, yes, the Israelites were here. And yes, they fled from here in this time. Even that, yes, it's possible that this sea could have dried up and given them a path to walk on. And so I'm watching that. I'm like, come on, don't diminish the power of God to do the impossible But then I realized God created at creation everything that would need to happen for miracles to be possible. We spend way too much time thinking about how impossible it is. All things are possible with God. So then we think there's all these impossible things. But no, he set into motion the ability for miracles to happen. If our skin cells can regenerate, so can organs. So can limbs, right? So why must miracles be so far and so unattainable? And it's not to diminish the power of God. It's to elevate that how perfect what he did at creation was. I mean, it's just blowing my mind. And have you ever seen the shoreline before a tsunami happens? Or right, I think it's right after a tsunami. It's like, oh, you know, half a mile, the coast drops back. It's like the parting of a Red Sea. (laughs) And... It's all God. We know it's all God because he's the creator of the universe. He can create tsunamis and polar vortexes and all these other weird phenomena. The northern lights, for heaven's sakes. Like, come on, people. We're surrounded by miracles. Miracles are not unattainable. Miracles are part of the Sabbath. It's provision. Okay, that was a side note. Rabbit trail. Um, So 1 Kings 5 verse 4 says, But now the Lord my God has given me rest on every side complete has given me rest on every side 
There is neither adversary nor misfortune. God wants his people whole. In this season, in this end time, we need to be whole. It is his will that we be whole. We will perish. I'm telling you, we will perish if we don't find this place of wholeness and completeness in him and begin observing these rhythms of rest that he set into place. Here's something fun. Fun fact, okay? This is one of the fun facts. I'm just going to slip in. No rest is one of the ways that people will be tormented in hell. Revelation 14, 11 says, And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day and night. Rest is a gift. No rest is a curse. God's serious about this. Isaiah 48, 22 says, There's no rest for the wicked, says the Lord. But for the righteous... For the righteous, I read this quote, it says, rest is a weapon given to us by God. The enemy hates it because he wants you to be stressed and occupied with everything else but the kingdom of God. So rest isn't sitting down on the job. Rest is supporting the job. Rest is making the work of the kingdom possible. Then Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made to meet the needs of people and not people to meet the requirements of the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even over the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a gift to us. It's not a law and a rule. It's a gift to us that he blessed it. See, there's this this giving and taking and addition by subtraction in there. So God blessed the Sabbath... And then he made it holy. So he blessed it. That's a gift. The definition of that word is a divine gift. And then he consecrated it, which is a taking. It's a consecration. It's a taking out of circulation. That day, that seventh day, he said, this is mine. Like when I married Ben. I took him out of circulation. He is consecrated. He is mine. And within, it, within that, we are blessed, right? It's addition by subtraction. God is so cool how he does that. So Hebrews 4, 9, 10, and we can all breathe right here. It says, there remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rest from their works, just as God did from his. So there's the need for physical rest. Write these down. Write these seven down as we go. You need physical rest. You need to sit in your lazy boy and do nothing. Pick a time, pick a day, pick a place once a week to to rest your physical bones, to lay them down. Jesus did it. You guys remember the story of him on the boat? Winds and waves going nuts. What's Jesus doing? Sleeping. Jesus took physical rest. He told Martha, sit your tail down. You're working too hard. You need to rest. Rest your bones. And then you need mental rest. You need to turn off the striving. Turn off the thinking, the problem solving. You need mental rest. Bible says be anxious for nothing. Nothing. Nothing deserves your mental energy for worry. But it says by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests may be made known to God and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Sensory rest. Turn off the TV the cell phone. We need moments of quiet. Sensory rest means you're depriving your senses of all the things that are around you. I knew a a couple years and years ago, and they did this fast. And, um, I mean, it was a hardcore fast. It was water only for so many days. 
They even fasted electricity and unplugged their refrigerator because the sound, they wanted complete quiet, the sound of the refrigerator was whirring in the background and they didn't want anything. They wanted complete silence. I'm not saying you have to do that, but that's, that's a type of sensory rest, getting in the quiet, turning off the screens, giving our eyes a rest, giving our ears a rest, You may even need to eat bland foods for a day, I don't know, to deprive your tongue senses. We go on vacation every year and we do lots of eating out because it's vacation. Who wants to cook on vacation? And my hubby gets so overwhelmed eventually because there's so much rich food, so much good food, so much sensory stimulation in the food we're eating that he's like, man, it's like I could really just go for a bowl of oatmeal right about now. (laughs) You know, we need that sensory deprivation, sensory rest, creative rest. Like that's, that's, the, that's the first one it was all about, right? God created, and then he rested from being creative, right? Creative rest. Emotional rest. Now, this one's interesting because it's like give your emotions a rest. What does that really mean? I mean, we're emotional being. Like I can't help it if I see something on a day and it makes me sad. Right? But this has more to do with the people pleasing. Anybody found yourself stressed out because of the people you're trying to please and the expectations you're trying to meet? Yeah, that's a big one. I took a, there's like a quiz out there, and I, sometimes it's fun to take quizzes. How many of you like a good quiz that tells you how, to, how you think? This is you, right? Love a good one of those. But I took this one, and, like, my numbers for emotional rest deprivation were, like, off the charts where the level where it says it's going to start affecting your physical health if you don't do something about it, right? It's pleasing. It's striving. I'm in a position where I hear the needs of a lot of people. I hear what's going on. I hear how broken people are. I want to make things fun and exciting in the events and all the stuff that we do. And so there's a lot of emotional um, energy that's packed into the work that I do. And then we need social rest. Here's a quote. Exhaustion depletes a person's skill at managing interpersonal relationships. When you are exhausted, you can't show the love of Jesus very good, right? Right? Sometimes you need a break from people. Sometimes you just need to get away from people. And then there's spiritual. We, our spirits, need rest. Psalm 62, 1 through 2, and this is in closing, says, Truly my soul finds rest in God. My salvation comes from him. Truly he is my rock and my salvation. God wants you to set aside times of rest and trust him for the other. So Ben and I have gotten very serious about our day of rest. So now that his schedule can mesh with mine, we have a Thursday Sabbath. We call it a Sabbath. Not to be religious or traditional about it, but because we need it. We need to take a day reflect on the Lord together, spend time together as a family, turn off the devices, get out in nature, admire God's creation. So we've been doing this Thursday Sabbath for a few weeks now. This past Thursday, and my, my basic rule for this is that I don't do laundry, I don't do dishes unless I'm just really excited and happy and motivated about doing dishes. But the laundry was piled up last Thursday. And I'm like, if I don't get some laundry done, I'm going to get to the weekend and it's just going to get worse. And then I'm going to be stressed on Monday. I was not, I got out of trusting the Lord that if I would let him handle the other six. And I got up and I did a load of laundry. And I tell you what, it may just be for me. But that set into motion a really stressful day for me. I started a load of laundry, and then it pushed me late getting out the door. Second thing we did wrong was we scheduled a haircut, so we had a deadline. 
somewhere to be. And I'm like, okay, I won't do that no more, Lord. I'm not doing that to myself because I need the rest. It's not that God was saying, hey, smack your hands. You didn't choose rest. But it's like I had this realization. When I'm doing laundry, that's not a restful activity for me. Some people find it that way, but not for me. Meeting a deadline, I meet deadlines every day. I have to be at work at a certain time. I have to be at church a certain time. Take a day that doesn't have deadlines, that doesn't have appointments. That's, I know that's what I need. The Lord showed that to me. So we must remember that in God's perfect completeness and perfect provision, he will take care of us. And if we are willing to honor him and set aside a rest time, he will make sure that things are taken care of. And those first three or four weeks, or I think it was three weeks, that we did a legitimate Sabbath, like we went outside, we did stuff with Simeon, and we didn't pay attention to any of our chores or anything like that. The Lord somehow multiplied my time the other six days because I was so much less stressed. My house was tidy for three weeks in a row. How does that happen? The Lord multiplied my time. And I got, I got back into works last Thursday, but I'm getting it right. I'm gonna, I know what I need now, and I know what works for me. But God is faithful, and this is his promise Isaiah 58, 13 through 14, it says, If because of the Sabbath you turn your foot from doing your own pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable, and honor it by deceasing from your own ways, from seeking your own pleasure and speaking your own word, then you will take delight in the Lord. And I will make you ride on the heights of the earth. And I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Would you stand with me? I want you guys to experience his rest, his rhythms of rest on the regular in your life. And I really, I really commission you to do that and if that's Sunday that's great if it's Monday that's great too Sundays aren't a day of rest for us we put a lot of effort and time into what happens here on Sunday mornings we we try to get with our families and do different things like that and make those commitments so we chose Thursday because that works for us but just set aside a time we wrote this prayer of blessing to pray over our Sabbath day, and I just want to share it with you. And if any of you are interested in a copy, um, the Hebrew people would start their Sabbath with a prayer of blessing. That's something they're really big on is prayers of blessing. We sing the blessing here at church. We sing that over you. The Lord bless and keep you, make his face shine upon you. Because there's power in our words. So we believe that we need to write something for our Sabbath, for our time of rest to kick it off and to speak blessing into that day for us. So it says, blessed are you, O Lord, King of the universe. Thank you, Father, that you are our place of rest. We thank you for all that you've brought us through. We know that you are using us for your glory. May this day bring Sabbath rest to our home. Let your image in us be restored and our imagination in you be restored. May the gravity of the material be lightened and the relativity of time slow down this day. Kindle your light in us as we set aside this day of rest to be holy unto you. We remember today that you alone are Lord. Amen.